Many blessings, everybody. It is a real honor to be here in your presence. Uh, thank you for being part of this conference for all of the days that you've been able to join us. It is such an honor to be here with you. What I want to try to do is I want to talk about this idea of us waking up and walking into our life's calling. With your permission, let's go ahead and get started. I want to ask you permission to speak. I know, not, I know that's kind of hard because you know you're across the computer all over the U.S., all over the world, but I just want to uh, ask you, would it be okay to continue? And in doing so, I brought you a little regalito. I brought you some sage. And I want to ask you uh, to think about your grandmother, to think about your abuelita. But I want you to go back seven generations, if you could, if your family tree, if you could search it and go back seven generations and think about that grandmother. She may have dreamed of you. You might be your ancestor's most wildest dreams. And for many reasons, we don't know her name. We can't say her name, but she existed and she dreamed of you. I want to light a little sage for her, but I also want to light a little sage for you. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've lost so many lives and we're in multiple pandemics. There's the pandemics of racism, the pandemics of sexism, the pandemics of capitalism, the pandemics of intergenerational poverty, and this pandemic of COVID. And because of that, just across the street from where I'm at, there are so many people that are living without homes. I want to light some sage for them, and I want to light some sage for you. And I just want to say thank you in a good way. Great spirit, my hope is that this is useful. My hope is that we channel the ancestors in a good way. And I just want to thank you so much for being here. With your permission, we're going to try to continue. Now, we are gathered here as Latinos, as Latinx, as Latin, as Raza at this really important conference. And a lot of us are professionals in different fields. And sometimes you're going to see me sort of come this way because I'm sharing a PowerPoint because I prepared a lot uh, to be here with you in this limited amount of time. And I want to read you this quote. It says, the two most important days are the day you were born and the day you found out why. That's heavy. And the second quote is, a career is what you're paid for, but a calling is what you're made for. And so that sounds powerful, that sounds heavy, but what does that even mean? In my own life, do I have a calling? What was I even made for, and why was I even born? I love these two photos because I don't have many photos from my childhood, but I want to take you back in time because we all had that childhood, you know, and, and uh, for some of us, it's really nice to go back to when we were five years old to remember and for others, it's a little bit harder. All of us carry experiences from our past and from our childhood. And I want to share you a little bit about some of the things that I carry. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to just take off this quote and then, and then we'll continue. Um, you know, in my life, I've carried five words. And one of those words that I've carried is this idea that I'm a bastard. My last name is Cruz, my father's last name is Cruz, but he left us when I was two years old. And I don't understand, for those of you that are parents out there, how do you abandon your children? And I don't know what happened, I just knew that at a very early age, I was like, ¿Y dónde está papi? The second word I remember really clearly, I was five years old, and my mom was talking about this beautiful place, y'all. There's a place where you don't need an immigrant li uh, lives movement, where you don't need a brown lives matter movement, or a black lives matter movement, or a women's rights movement. There's this beautiful place where they treat women well, where they treat immigrants well, where they treat Latinos well. My mom was dreaming of a fictional place called the United States of America. And she was going to go there, but she needed to journey and cross a desert without me. And so Cesar was going to have to stay with the abuelos. This is my abuelita Socorro. This is my abuelito Angel. And they would be my caretakers. But my mom would soon leave. 
And I don't know if any of you are parents out there and if you've ever had kids cling on to you and say, Mommy, no te vayas. Mommy, no te vayas. And so that was me clinging on to my mom as my mom left to cross that border into the United States. I didn't know that she would deal with Migra. I didn't know that she would be arrested. I didn't know that she would be deported. I had no idea what was coming in her life. I just knew that mommy left. And now I'm five years old and dad is gone. Y mi mamá también. I got some good news though. I'm nine years old now. Four years have passed. I crossed that border. Next time when you bring me back, I'll tell you how that happened. That'll be for another day. But I make it to the other side. Now I'm in Compton, California, before NWA. This is the late 70s, the early 80s. And I reconnected with my mom, y'all. I'm hugging at my mom. I'm connecting with my mom. And she says to me, mijo, tú eres ilegal. Tú eres mojado. And I was like, mom, ¿qué es eso? What are you talking about? Like, what is this kind of welcome to America? My mom said that I'm illegal, that I'm a wetback. She went on to say that I have no rights. She went on to prepare me for the day that immigration would come. And I had no idea what she was talking about. I'm nine years old. <sighs> but the day would come. Six months later, the migra showed up to the factory where my mom works. And she was thrown in a paddy wagon and beaten with her friends. And my mom was deported. This is the era where we don't have cell phones yet. There's no way to connect with my mom. I came home from school and mommy's not there. This country wanted me to learn English really badly. And my grandmother wanted me to retain some Spanish. And so I became both perdido and lost. What I didn't know, this is a powerful book called Subtractive Schooling by Dr. Angela Valenzuela. What I didn't know is that I was also lost to my own culture, to my own roots. I didn't even know that I had any. Doctora Valenzuela has this idea, and it's the title of her book. She says that the more time you spend in most U.S. schools, the more things get subtracted from you. Wait, is she crazy? Wait, you go to school and things get taken from you? She says, yes, your history, your culture, your pride, your language, your roots. And Doctora Valenzuela, I don't want to believe you, but I'm speaking to you in a language from England, and I'm not an Englishman. English is not a, a, a language indigenous to the Americas. Y si les empiezo a hablar en español, el español no es de mi país, es de España. Y yo no soy español, soy mexicano. But what happened to my Nahuatl and Sotzil and Quechua? And what happened to Mum? And what happened to other indigenous languages? When did they take my tongue? When did they make me into a perfect European that speaks English and Spanish but has no idea about his indigenous roots? What happened to me? When did Cesar become Caesar? And when did Maria become Mary? We've been subtractively schooled. Our friends at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, they did a study for all of you that are parents and have young children and you can't wait to buy books that look like them, that reflect their history. They did a study just three years ago to count all of the children's literature. Even though the Latino, the Latinx community is now the largest ethnic group in the United States, did you know that only 5% of all of children's literature centers the Latino, the Latinx community? That's criminal. Because when you look in the mirror and you don't see the different shades of brown, when you don't see who you are, when you don't see yourself reflected, some of us begin to develop inferiority complex. And when you're overly represented, some of us begin to develop superiority complexes. You're like, pa que vine? What's going on? Um, but I want you to take a deep breath and uh, we're going to shift and we're going to, we're going to tilt. It isn't just about us living in nightmares or things that have happened to us in the past. How do we reconnect to who we really are? And an answer that I'd like to humbly offer is this idea of intergenerational wisdom. Let me explain what I mean. There's a field of science that can trace that trauma can pass through my body when they trace the DNA of me and my mother and my grandmother. That field of science is called epigenetics. 
But if there is a field of science that tells us that we carry intergenerational trauma, of course we carry the wisdom of the abuelas. That is intergenerational wisdom. But science has never wanted to study that. So there isn't a field of science called intergenerational wisdom. Not yet. That is why this conference is so valuable. That is why all the organizers have been working so hard to put this together. Because our, our cultura cura. And our roots are really important. And so how do I reclaim mine? Well, as you look at this image, I have to remember. I have to put back together the things that were taken. Even the language of Nahuatl that I can no longer speak. It starts off by realizing that we're astronomers, y'all. We study the sun, moon, and stars in Peru, where we built Machu Picchu, in Guatemala, where we built Tikal, in, in, in Boriquen, what we now know as Puerto Rico, in Mexico, where there's Chichen Itza. We come from astronomers. And what does it mean for us to honor that scientific inquiry in us? We're also mathematicians, y'all. We have a calendar that, not, that traces 5,000 years worth of history. We are the keepers of time. And it is important that we understand that Mayan numerology. Now, I want you to take a look at this map. This map is really interesting because it says it has Mexico in it. And I'm sitting right here in Oakland, California. Wait, but Oakland is in here. And I asked my grandmother when she was alive. I was getting a phone call, but I can't take it. We're in the middle of it. We got to go to it. As you know, we're live, and I'm so thankful to be here with y'all. Maybe my abuela was calling from the ancestor world. Yo no sé. Apologize for that. But my grandma gave me this regalo. She gave me this calendar. And I said, abuelita, how old is this calendar? And my abuelita said, this calendar is two grandmothers ago. And I was like, abuelita, what do you mean? She's like, well, when my abuelita, she said, was here, we didn't need a green card. And Cesar, I need you to pronounce this right. I need you to say California, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, Nuevo Mexico. You need to understand, Cesar, that you and your people did not cross the border, but the border crossed us. Stop thinking of yourself as an immigrant. You are not an immigrant, Cesar. This is your indigenous land. My mind was blown. It was completely blown. I couldn't believe that someone stopped calling me their wetback and their illegal alien. And there was documented proof that I'm on ancestral land. For if you come from the Mexicano people, you are in Mexicano land, in indigenous land, in Mexica land. And so what does it mean for you to reconnect to your roots? And now I just happen to be undocumented, but I know where I come from. I began to learn about sheroes that they never taught us about. I want to introduce to some of you and affirm to others, Lucy Gonzalez Parsons Presente. They were so scared of Lucy that they banned her from the city of Chicago. She was organizing in the 1880s. She wanted to end child labor. She was standing up for the 888 movement. Only eight hours of work, not 16-hour days. Eight hours of play and eight hours of sleep. They have her body buried in Chicago. She's part of the Haymarket Affair, an amazing organizer. But this is a history of a people we've never been told. And then I want to fast forward Silvia Mendez, this young lady during World War II, is suing the state of California in the famous case Mendez versus Westminster to fight to desegregate all public schools in California. It is because of her that I am. And Silvia Mendez is still alive. I want to show you this video when Silvia Mendez is receiving the highest medal of honor given to any civilian in the U.S., she's receiving the Presidential Medal of Honor for standing up for her rights. Take a look at this. Silvia Mendez was thrust to the forefront of the civil rights movement when she was just a child. Denied entry to the Westminster School because of her Mexican heritage, she sought justice and her subsequent legal case, Mendez versus Westminster, effectively ended segregation as a matter of law in California. The arguments in that case catalyzed the desegregation of our schools and prevailed in the landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, forever changing our nation. 
Today, Sylvia Mendez continues to share her remarkable story and advocate for excellence and equality in classrooms across America. I never learned about you in school, Silvia. I didn't know we're desegregators. I didn't know that you fought so that I could graduate from high school one day. I'm the first in my family to graduate middle school. I didn't know that high school was a possibility. I had no idea that one day I'd go to UC Berkeley, but that I was ill prepared and that it would take me 17 years to get my undergrad. I had no idea that one day I'd go to Harvard University and become the first Mexican immigrant male in this particular program to get a doctorate. I don't say that to brag, I say that to say thank you. Thank you, Silvia, for paving the way because too many of us don't know what has been fought for and we're kind of sleeping on our privileges. Some of us have the right to study in this country. Some of us were born in this country. Some of us have citizenship and we're sleeping on it and we're not answering our life's calling because we haven't heard of you, Silvia. Muchísimas gracias. As you take a look at this image, this is an image that terrified me for a long time, but not anymore. This is the image of the U.S.-Mexico border. And in that border, they have folks with shotguns and they're hunting my mother. And my mother was deported on three different occasions, but she always found a way to come back to her ancestral homeland. When I was 17 years old, I'm getting ready to be the first in my family to graduate from high school. And I can't wait for my jefita to come home to make it back. And when she comes back before my graduation, what a blessing. I was like, mom, que no tienes miedo? Aren't you afraid of this border? And my mom, using some of her sociological speak, she's like, mijo, no seas menso. And I was like, what do you mean, mom? She's like, I've been learning my history from your abuela. Now that border is a very real border. That border is 20 feet high. But when you start to know where you come from, when you start to know your rights, when you start to know that you matter, you carry an invisible 21 foot ladder. I want to give you that ladder, mijo, and I want you to use it for the rest of your days. I had no idea what my mom was gifting me. I didn't fully understand. And it's now that I'm almost 50 years old that I'm beginning to understand that we are the inheritance of 21 foot ladders. You carry them. Your abuela paid for it. You carry these ladders. So there's no borders that can stop us, but they sure do try. And I'm not saying that the odds aren't stacked against us. They are. We are still the majority in California and U.S. prisons. We are still the ones on the front lines. We are still the ones that are living in some of the worst conditions in the U.S., but that does not mean that we don't carry a 21-foot ladder. As I began to find mind, I needed, and I realized that I had to write. I had to tell the stories of what was happening, and it began in napkins, and then it went to journals, and then eventually I would publish books. This is the first book that I wrote called Revenge of the Illegal Alien. And it is important that when you write, you R-I-G-H-T, that you correct the wrongs of society. And then I didn't know that I would become a teacher, but for the last 27 years, I've been able to work with young people in the Bay Area, and that has been the privilege of my life. I had no idea that I would get to be part of an organization, and, and open an organization called Homies Empowerment, where we're feeding over 2,000 people a week, where we're building our own uh, health care that will be free for all, building housing, access to land, building our own high school, and doing so in a community that has been given up on. But I think for me, one of the joys of my life is that I get to be a husband. We're about to celebrate our 20-year anniversary, and we got three amazing kids, Olina, Maru, and Quetzali. And it's the joy of my life to reconnect familia because we don't come from broken homes. We just come from oppressive environments sometimes, and it is our duty to reclaim our life's calling. And as I close... I want to ask you, you that are at this conference, would you align your passion and your mission and your profession and your vocation? And when you do, you are going to be in that developmental sweet spot because you're going to be living out your life's calling. And in order to get there, all you have to do is reclaim who you are, remember who you are, and reconnect to your greater purpose. Muchísimas gracias for taking the time to listen. I hope that you're able to share these messages. 
and just thank you so much and never forget that 21-foot ladder that you carry that is always part of your DNA. Muchísimas gracias.